Hello, I'm Sherry Kleba. I'm the high school science and technology teacher here at the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. And my presentation today is about the flipped classroom, the flipped classroom webinar. Okay, let's go ahead and begin. First, I'll talk about what a flipped classroom is. Here we go. When you think about a traditional classroom, you think about a teacher standing in front of her classroom, lecturing, having the students do some paperwork, some drills, some classwork, and then having homework as well. And there's not a lot of support. In the flipped classroom, that's opposite. We tend to have the lectures on the video, and I will explain about that later. Then the students will watch the lecture at home, take notes, do projects, activities, all of those things happen in the classroom with support from the teacher. I went to a technology workshop last year, last summer, and I learned about the flipped classroom. And I thought it would be a perfect application for deaf students. We learned a lot about brain chemistry, and that if you're watching a lecture after 20 minutes, your attention goes away, and you're not focused. And I think that's really important to try to help our students focus better. And a lot of our students are digital natives, and that means they were born with technology. They've been born and raised with this technology. They watch films, they play games, variety of different things related to the digital era, and we can use that. I noticed with the science lecture, my lectures, they're great, yes, but just for a particular set of students. Maybe the higher, late, higher grade level students may get bored, and so I try and, ex you know, maybe I'm explaining things too slow, and then these higher grade level students are being bored, and then the other lower level students are asking me to repeat everything. So then I'd have to stop and repeat again, and then I've lost the rest of the students. So that was a real struggle. So I really needed to find a better way to provide the lecture. With a flipped classroom, now more students are involved in their own learning. And they can learn in a variety of different ways, not just watching a film, and then they also, you know, look through the books, there's internet, they're writing notes, there's a variety of different resources. And it's more than just one way of providing the information given through lecture. I'm just going to talk about how now, how we start with the flipped classroom. So first I make the video. And I'll talk about that more in depth in a little bit. So I make the video. And it's a simple program. It's Movie Maker. And then I edit it. I add some captions, different things like that. And then I upload to either two different places. One is teachertube.com. And the other one is Daily Motion and both.com. So I upload them to those two sites. And then I do look for other online resources for the students as well. Different websites where they can get the information as well, or other online activities. And then I produce a checklist, and I'll show you that in just a second. That's on the PowerPoint. And then there's something that they will, it will show what they do at home and then also the activities in the classroom. So they do know ahead of time what they're supposed to do for that unit. And it does give them independence, yes, but they also have a timeline. That means they can't, it can't take three months to finish their work. I will say this is due maybe two weeks from now. I'll give them that timeline. So they know that that's due within that, that time frame. I also use Edmodo, and it's an online educational resource, and the, all the videos can be uploaded on there. There's PowerPoints that are uploaded, homework, everything on there. 
again with a, a due date again. And I use that with all of my classes. And finally, I also use something called quizstar.forteachers.org. And that's an online testing website. And I've used that for a long time now, not just for this year. I've always been using this type of thing. It's really nice. It helps with the grading for you and everything. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. You can go on. And so you can see on the PowerPoint, so this is an example of my checklist. And you can see on one side, the things that are happening in the classroom. And on the other side is what they're expected to do at home or in the dorm outside of classroom. And I also have links to my videos on here and other websites that they can view as well to learn from that there's a variety of choices they, they, they can look at to show projects as well. Okay. I'm going to talk about how I make the videos themselves. First, I have to figure out what I want to put on the video, what I want to teach. I've been using a lot of PowerPoint, so I take those and I make some kind of script from that or an outline. Sometimes I have my laptop and the PowerPoint open at the same time while I'm making the video watching that. With science, we tend to have a lot of props, different things that I bring in to, to show. And I always think about how to make them fun, to make them interesting. I don't want them to be boring and then just again having them just watch this lecture. I try to make them interesting. I do make mistakes and that's absolutely fine. You know, you can have fun with the students a little bit. You can add jokes. It is a little bit tough though because you're you're signing to the camera. It's not like you have an audience in front of you. So it is a little bit different, but it will be successful. Normally I make the videos eight minutes or less for several reasons. Because there's a lot of memory being used to make the video. If you have a, a long video, it could be less quality or less memory involved in that. So I tend to have it either eight minutes or less. And I know some students maybe only have a few minutes, you know, here and there to be able to watch the videos. So I think eight minutes or less is great. If there's a topic that I know maybe will take longer than just an eight minute time frame of a video, I'll split it up into a couple of parts, maybe part one and part two. I tend to set up a, a tripod, get that ready. And I usually make several videos at one time, so I don't set everything up just for one video. I tend to make more at the same time. So I do several things at the same time once everything's set up. So I set the camera up, I sign the lecture, and then I sign it again. It's, it just makes it easy to edit it later. So I don't have to go over to the camera, stop it, start again. I just do it twice. So I start making it. I, that's what I did actually at the beginning. I'd start it and then I go over. You could see my hand in it. It was silly. So I realized that I could just edit out all of those things later. And I make them at home. I make my videos at home. For me, that's been working. I do it in the evening, you know, in the afternoon, whenever, or even on the weekend, whenever I have time. I use my own personal video camera. So you can use the one at your school. Maybe if you have a laptop that has a webcam, you could use that. There's a variety of different resources out there that you can use. A lot of people can make them on their phone now. You can make videos with your phone. And again, you can use a script or have a PowerPoint set up that you can look at. Please remember, it does not have to be perfect. I remember one video I made, I made a mistake spelling something. And then the next day I asked the students, hey, did you see the video? And people said yes. And I said, what word did I misspell? And I caught them. I thought, huh, maybe you didn't watch that because they weren't able to answer that question. So just make it fun. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to stand up and think, okay, I have to do this in one time and make it perfect. That's not how it works. You can edit things later, change things. 
So just relax, enjoy it, have fun with it, okay? So I'm making the videos, I edit, and I use Movie Maker, it's free on my computer at home, it's free. And then I can upload the video, and then I can add some pictures. I can add the title, and I'll show you a video in just a minute. And that's nice through Movie Maker. You could buy software, but it might be expensive and then they'll edit it. I, I really don't know. I don't need to do that because I already have Movie Maker set up. So we're going to add the title, and I think that's important to add that. I have my name on there. And I don't caption everything. I don't add everything. I found with my students in the past, for example, with the PowerPoint, they just copy everything down into their notes, everything I put up on their PowerPoint. I think, are they just copying or are they really comprehending this? Because I'll ask them, explain back to me what you just wrote down, what we just talked about. And a lot of times they can't do that. And I didn't want them to do the same thing with the video. I was really concerned that they would just pause the video and just copy down everything that I would be signing. And I didn't want that. So you can see on the video, the keywords, I tend to fingerspell. And some really long words, complicated words, I may add that and then add the captions as well. And sometimes I have a list, you know, of five different things, and then it'll be it's number one, and then I'll talk about it. But there's no caption that goes along with that because, again, I don't want them to copy the captions. I want them to watch me and watch my sign and really get the content of what I'm talking about. My first video, I forgot to put the sound off. So that means you can hear my dog barking in the background. You can hear my daughter talking. And I thought, oh, oops. So later, that you know was something I learned and changed later. Because in Movie Maker, there is an option to turn the sound off. So you don't have that. And I only sign. My voice is off. I don't use any voice. And then the last thing, there are different ways in Movie Maker um, to use different things to save to save the video. Save it to email. You can save it for, I save it for making CDs. Save it for a variety of different reasons. There's different ways to do that. And high quality means a lot of memory. Low, low quality means less. So that would be less quality if there's a lot of memory. So you really have to figure out what, how to save it the best, and try to limit the size of it, again, back to that eight-minute time frame, just so there's a higher quality. I think up to, it's up to 400 megabytes, I think that's all that you can upload onto that site. Again, it depends on how you save it, so definitely pay attention to that, especially if you're saving it three or four different ways, which you can, absolutely, but be conscious of that size. Okay, so you've made the movie, you've made the video, you've edited it, and now you're ready to upload it. And you can use TeacherTube.com and also Daily Motion. I just talked about those two. So TeacherTube, that's nice because it's all focused on educational things. So you can upload the video, you can add some tags to that, some comments, and people can find that video easier. The problem with that, though, that you have to wait one or two days. Somebody has to screen it. They have filters set in place. They check that out, and then they will upload it. And that's nice. So it means that everything's available. Everything that's available there is educational based. So that's nice. With Daily Motion, it's a lot like YouTube. Anybody can upload upload anything. So just be cautious, you know, I, I tell my students just to be cautious because remember, if you use daily motion to view the video, you may be watching some things that show up that are not appropriate because again, it's similar to YouTube. So I let them know that, you know, and they say, okay. 
but the safer one would be teacher two. But it is nice with daily motion because it's there immediately. There's no, there's none of that one or two days waiting. You don't have to wait. It's automatically posted. And at the same time, I'm, I'm creating the video. I also make a CD, and that's really good because you can use a CD on any computer. You can put the disc in, and they can watch the video. And I usually put a lot of videos on one CD, so there's a lot contained on one. I also make some DVDs at the same time as well. DVDs are nice because you don't, uh, you can either put on the computer or a laptop. You don't really need that. Almost everybody nowadays has a DVD player, so you can actually just put on a DVD player and watch it on your TV. So I'm really trying to, to provide a lot of different ways that the students can have access to the videos. And the nice thing about CDs and DVDs is once you can upload pictures to the video if you want to, of the students that are included. If it's daily motion or teacher two, they're available to everybody. So I don't add anything, you know, their pictures or their face or anything like that. But for the CD or the DVD, that's only available for in the classroom use. So we can add more pictures, the students' projects, maybe from the past, maybe from the last couple of years, other videos, maybe if the students have made a video of themselves and explained something about their project, those are things that can be added to a CD or a DVD. Obviously, you can't add those to the two online sites, both TeacherTube and Daily Motion. They have links. And then I give those to the I can give those to the student, even to the dorm staff, to the parents, other teachers. And so that's available everywhere out there. Now we're going to try to connect to two of my videos that I've made. Which one are we doing first? Let's do the teacher tube. And that's the one from biology class, the kingdom, kingdoms of life, of living things. Let's see if they and I can't see the video, but you'll be able to see that. And then I'll let the interpreter go ahead and first for you. And this one is about kingdoms of living things. And we have, we'll have we have a student discussion later. Right now, we're just going to focus on a few things. The kingdoms right now. Let me explain those. The most basic, the most simple. Those terms we'd start with are monera or monarian. And just as very basic, not that they're not important or worthy, but they're included. The second one would be protus. And then the third, fungi or fungus. That would be like mushrooms. Maybe molds would be included in that as well. And the first two, it's really hard. You can't see from the first two that I explained. The third one, you can. So a lot of the fourth one I want to talk about is plants, and then another group of the kingdom is animals. And so these five, we're just going to talk about these different groups. And you you've seen enough. You've seen how how it works. And then you see how I do add a few captions, but not the whole thing. Again, because I want them to focus on the signs and really get the content from my signs.
just wait one second, sorry. Having some technology issues. Okay, we're going to go ahead and continue. So we have a second video. Do we have that set up that we could show? From Daily Motion. The characteristic of an ecosystem, of an ecosystem, and there are five different vocabulary words included with this. The first one is consumer. The second one, decomposers. Third, habitat. Niche. And the fifth one, producers. I'm going to talk about and explain each one of these vocabulary words. If I ask you, where do you live? Maybe you'll say, I live in a house. I live in a tent. Or if I ask, where does a squirrel live? You might say, in a tree, underground. Again, where would a polar bear live? Maybe in the northern part, in the Arctic, in all of those locations where they live, those are called habitats. And this is my sign for habitat. Their habitat must provide all the needs necessary for their survival. They have to provide food in that area. There needs to be air. Also shelter, a place for an animal or someone to hide to be safe. Also for reproduction purposes as well. And if they don't, if this area does not meet all of these needs, then they would have to be moved. Great. So you can see an example. So you can see an example of both of those, both teacher tube and daily motion. Really, they're easy to use. I just sit there in my living room, set up the camera, and the students can see me sign on a video. It's a really simple process. At first, I was really nervous, but as I went along, it just became a habit. when I learned about flipped classroom last year, they were using other methods as well. Of course, in a hearing classroom in a, in a public school, they tended to have a whiteboard or a PowerPoint. And then they, are we good? Okay, right place. Here we go. Picture in picture is what we're talking about. So they would have, you know, a whiteboard or something interactive with, or with a, a PowerPoint set up. And then they would have a, a smaller picture of themselves speaking. When I first started making the video, or when they first started making the video, they would have the full screen with the PowerPoint or the whiteboard. And then you could just hear the person and the other people said, no, we prefer to see the person's face. So they added that picture in picture. And, but I thought for me and for my situation, it wouldn't be successful. Again, I don't want the students just to be copying the information from the PowerPoint. And if I was concerned if I was the smaller screen, they wouldn't be able to see my signs clearly. So I, I don't use the picture in picture, but that may be successful for some other people. 
it next week. And it should be obvious now the ways that the students will watch the videos. I, of course, prefer online. I do pref prefer that. But there, is, there are the CDs. That's an option. Also DVDs. Some students even now can watch it on their phones, which is great. I think it's too small to watch, but they're used to that small screen, whether they're watching videos or a TV show, and they watch it on the phone. So that's fine. If they use that, that's fine. And I also make them available before and after school and lunchtime. Most students don't choose, choose that, though. I wonder why. <laughs> They're busy. They have busy life, social. You know, they prefer that. But we do have them available those times. And the last choice would be in the classroom. And the reason being is because I, wa I really want them to watch it at home or in the dorm so then the classroom can be more focused on activities. And that means if they're watching it during class, that means they are going to miss the activities. So I do explain that to them, and sometimes they don't have a choice. They don't have those options available to them, so that's the last resort. And so they do sit in the classroom during class and watch the video. And I want the students to be responsible for these videos. And how I do that is once I, I ask them to watch the video and I ask them to make a comment on the video, there's a place to make comments on that link. Obviously, if they took the time to make a comment, it means they watch the video. Or I ask them to take notes after they watch it and then they have to show me their notes. So I approve that in a way that they're showing me that they watch that video. Sometimes I make an outline, and I leave some of the words blank, and I follow the video format so they can watch the video, and during the video they can pause it and fill in the blank once they see the answer on the video. And before, you know, like I told you, I made mistakes in some of the signs, so I'll ask them questions related to the video, like, what mistake did I make? And then they make a comment, or I'll say, what prop did I use in this particular video? Or, you know, what did I use? Something like that. And they'll say, oh, you used a toaster or something like that. So obviously they watch the video. Sometimes the next day I'll have a pop quiz, and I'll ask questions based on the video. And depending on their answers, I know if they watch the video or not. And here are some other options. Again, I said there's a lot of videos online, a lot of resources out there. Some have captions. Some would be good for auditory learners as well, so they can watch that at the same time. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to access some of those. So the advantages now for the flipping the classroom. There's so many. A lot of times students need that repetition to really understand the, the content of what's being said. One time is not enough. And a lot of times during typical lectures, it's just said one time, and, and that person's out of luck if they didn't get it because they don't have access to that lecture 24 hours a day. So I'm empowering the student to take responsibility for their own learning. A lot of students just sit there and they watch the lecture. They may write a few notes, but it's, it's not being understood. They're not comprehending. And they need to be able to understand that. And now it's there. They have no excuse. It's there for them to watch. And I tend to use mastery learning. Just 75% is needed or better to move on to the next unit. So if they take the test at the end and they continually fail, after the third time, I stop them. Because really the average score, if they're failing, and then maybe they pass it just by a few points, I don't think that's good enough. I prefer, once they failed it, to sit down, provide more support, and give them that opportunity for learning because I really want them to get the information. I don't want them just to be able to pass. I want them to comprehend and really know the information. 
And if a student asks me something and I teach that particular student, I answer their question, explain to them what they were asking about, and then if another student comes up, maybe they ask me the same question. Instead of me answering, I direct them to the other student. I say, here's an expert over here that I just explained this to. So this other student will explain to this student. And to be honest with you, I don't sign and everything that I do is not perfect. I think it's better for the student to learn from another student other than me. I think that's great. And then as the student is explaining, it's obvious that they're understanding what's been taught to them. So it benefits both of them. And I think that can be fun as well. And again, this really supports independence. They can work at their own pace. They want to do it quickly. Others may take a little bit more time, and that's absolutely fine. Again, I always do provide a timeline. I don't let them just drag it out. I do provide them a timeline and a due date, but they can work independently. They can work on the bus. You know, if they're watching something on their phone or at home, they can work on this anytime. So they know they have no excuse. And that leaves more time in the classroom for projects, for one-on-one -on -one support, for activities, to really expand on explanations. So there's more opportunity to do that during class time. Recently, like if a student asked me about vocabulary, for example, I can sit down and explain to them and just recently, I did that, and I explained the vocabulary, and that student passed with 100%. So obviously, that helped them, having that time in class. And they didn't just pass barely, because we actually sat down and they understood and passed it with 100%. And I also offer differentiation, because maybe there's some high-level students, and they want to go through the book as well. I do not require them to look at the video if they can get that information through the book and they can write down notes, what chapters they're on. That's okay if they want to work quickly at that pace. And then there's other students who are struggling a bit more and they do want to watch the video. Plus, maybe they need some extra support, maybe some on online resources that I provide. And so that's really important to provide that as well, that differentiation. And my paperwork has decreased so much. Before, every Monday, I would have the vocabulary list, and I would make copy, copy after copy. And then I have to write their names down on each one, try to figure out which one I'm giving it to, match each student. Oh, I missed one from this student. Maybe another student lost one. I have to go to the copy machine again. And I thought, hmm, this takes away a lot of that. Edmodo. Is there so if the students want to print they can if they just want to maybe watch it just for a little bit of something and if they don't want to print it if they get enough information by watching it so it's up to them and a lot of times we have students who come to school late not at the beginning of the year for whatever reason they miss have missed maybe they've been sick for a week or Maybe they don't come until second semester or for another unit. It's very varied. And that's tough sometimes to keep, every, keep track of what each student is doing, what unit they're on, where they are in the, in the process. So that's difficult sometimes. So that's how a lot of times it changes. Like we think, OK, on Monday, my lesson plan is this. This is what I teach. So this changes all of that. Because you have all these different students at different on different units and at different places in the progress. So what I've done is I make a lesson plan kind of like a calendar. And I put down who's where on Monday. I get that all figured out. And then the next unit, I write down who I think will be ready for that unit coming up. So I put that down on the calendar. And then I make the unit plan. I set that up. And that's really my lesson plan. And then I give it to my principal to show that those the, what units are ready, both the calendar and the unit. So the principal knows what's going on. So it's not really what I'm teaching that day or at that time, because I really don't teach that way anymore. And the principal is satisfied with that because I'm keeping them up to date. OK, on to the next one.
independence has to be specifically taught. A lot of students don't have that skill, so you have to teach them how to be independent. Sometimes students saying, well, what am I supposed to do? And I'll say, I don't know, what are you supposed to do? And they just sit there. So again, I have to help them and work with them so they understand what they're supposed to do and they continue with that process. O other students pick it up right away and they get that. Others, you have to sit and actually explain, here's the checklist, this is what you're supposed to do and teach that independence. A big issue this year is technology and the access. There's some problems on campus, some issues on campus, and also technology access at home. Some students may not have a laptop or a computer at home, or they may not have internet at home. So again, that's an issue that I think can definitely be overcome with the use of the CDs and the DVDs. So that's something to think about. With my videos, there is no auditory. And there may be some students um, who are oral, so that may be a difficulty. So you'd have to find videos for those oral students, for auditory learners. And again, it is a, a paradigm shift. The culture is changing. And you have to be able to move between the two. And also finding the time to actually make the video, edit, upload. It does take some time. There is a lot of time involved in that. But I know this year, it took a lot of time, but next year would probably be easier. It's not going to be completely easy, but I think it would be less time consuming. And really, it's, I have like 30 or 35 vid videos already available. So I know the process, how it can be a lot quicker because I know how to edit. I know how to set everything up now. And I know sometimes it's different because you have to teach to a camera and there's nobody to look at. It's different than teaching to a crowd. So it's a little bit harder where you have your eye contact and it's nice to have the feedback, you know, from people in the audience. So it's a little bit different with the camera. So that can be tough sometimes. Next. And I was thinking how flipping could apply to other content areas. Science is what I know. So I know how to do that, but I'm thinking how you could apply it to math or social studies or other content areas, other classrooms. And I think math teachers, you know better than I do, but I've been thinking about different ideas. And I thought maybe doing a video of like common processes, like order of operations, for example, FOIL, I think math teachers, you know what I'm talking about when I say that, you know, what, but the rules of fractions, that type of thing. So common things like that, that you teach over and over again, that's something that could be videoed. And then word problems, maybe how to solve them, that might be another option that would work well with this. And then you're probably thinking once you make the video, what do you do in the classroom? But you can use that time for projects, for the measurements for STEM, that type of thing in the classroom, addition practice with support, because the teacher is right there, social studies, Thinking what maybe the content could be World War II or whatever, something like that. And then during class, they would have more opportunity for class discussion once they've already watched the video, more interaction with the students, and talk about current events as well. And then language, maybe this is a shift, like, um, using punctuation, capitalization, how the body of a paragraph looks, different storytelling, different styles of writing. One teacher last year, the English teacher, they gave me a paper to look over, and then the teacher was going to make a video explaining how they edited that paper. And that video was only available for that one particular student. And I thought, well, if that's successful, great. If it's something to do with reading, maybe there could be questions related to the reading on the video. Again, it provides more time in the classroom for that writing opportunity in the classroom after they've watched that. Even for PE, I've thought about. You could make a video about the rules of different games maybe the rules of basketball, soccer, whatever. You could make a video explaining those rules. Again, 
there's more time in the classroom for actual movement, actual application of those things. And the next one says, well, would I do it again? This flipped classroom? And my answer is a resounding yes, obviously. And I'm just going to, I'm going to keep going. I know we just have just a few minutes left because I want to leave some time for some questions. You can go on. And what would I change next time? I would definitely have more parent involvement. I started a little bit late this year, probably a month into school I started. So next year I would definitely start right away, right at the beginning of the year. Maybe I'd make some videos during the summer and have them ready for the next year. For science, maybe I would videotape safety in lab, how to set up an experiment, that type of thing. And so here are some things that you should think about before you start. It should be gradual, a gradual process. Because you will make mistakes. You don't want to, you know, change everything all at once. It was a lot for me to do that. Maybe just pick, like, one class and just flip that one class. And then maybe next year you could add on to that. So definitely it's a gradual process. Start slow. And also check to see if... There's other videos that are covering that content. So you don't have to make every video. You can see if there's others out there already. And again, this doesn't solve all your issues. There's still the issue with accountability. If a student, if a student doesn't want to do their homework, they're not going to do that. And there's the technology issues, of course. And then also think about using the resources you already have. If you already have a PowerPoint, worksheets, use those to start with, to start making those videos, okay? And then here's just a few more things to think about. And think about if it's something that would work for you. Would it work for your classroom? Maybe not, and that's fine. But there are other ways to flip it, to empower the students to really take responsibility for their own learning. And also think about how you'll edit the videos. Do you have the time? Do you have the equipment? Do you have the software? Would you do it at home? Would you do it at school? So think about those things. And also copyright issues. We can't just find a picture and add it to a video or a student picture of their faces and just add it. You can't do that. You have to be very careful. And think outside the box. I thought maybe if I went camping, that would be really cool. I just recently went. I thought it would be cool if I made a video while I was out there of the trees, the forest. It doesn't always have to be sitting in the living room at home. It doesn't always have to be that way. It can be in different locations. If you go to a museum, maybe make a video there. There are other places. So, again, think out of the box. Now I know we went through it a little bit quickly because we had the technical issues, but I'm wondering if there's any questions, any comments that have been made. Oh, so wait one minute on that. So it looks like people are typing in their comments. Go ahead and ask questions. Any questions, guys? That's fine. The PC thing, I missed what you said about differentiation. 
Good. So the different, the videos, the different levels for the differentiation levels. They're asking me about the, the differences in the classroom for the different levels. This year, I didn't make the different levels. I just made one video for each content topic. However, the classroom, it's easy to have that differentiation. But you can make a video for each level. You could do that. And I've been thinking about how to do that. You could have, if I had the video set up, I would make the video for a really high level and then I would slow down the science a little bit for the moderate level, add some more description perhaps. So you could do that. I think it would be easy to do that. I have not yet this year done that, but I think it's a great idea to do that. And in the classroom, it's easier for that to match the levels. And there's some for the higher level that they don't watch that video. They get their content through the book. And then there's other students who will watch the video and they get it just the one time through. Then there's the other students who watch it over and over repetitively and get it that way. So if I'm hoping that answers your question. There was another question. Sorry for the technical problems, but the video will be there soon. So if you missed any part of this, you can watch the whole thing, the whole webinar later. It will be available later, definitely. And Edmodo as well. If you have not yet joined that group, I think they have a link available. And then I will upload that onto the PowerPoint. And then other people can add comments as well through that. Oh, it looks like there's another question. What do you prefer? Did you prefer the teacher tube or daily motion? Okay, which one do I prefer? Hmm. Honestly, I like teacher tube because of the filter system. That means I know that the students, when they're watching that, what they're seeing is appropriate. But I have a lot of problems with the uploading to TeacherTube. It'll be going along fine, and then it, I'll lose it. It will stop. It will freeze. I'll have to keep starting over. Just recently it happened. And every once in a while, there'll be a problem with student access for that as well. I guess both, sorry, <laughs> I know that's not the best answer, but daily motion, I've never had a problem uploading ever. I've never had a, a problem uploading. It immediately does it very quick. And I don't have any problem with it freezing or losing connection. So that's my best answer that I can give you. Oh, another question? So how do you caption those videos? Again, I do not caption everything. I don't want the students to just pause and rely on all of the content and, and copying that. I add a few words on the screen, maybe numbers. I'll say number one, two, three, four, and then signs. I have that, those words on the screen. I've been using Movie Maker, and it's really easy. There's a little box, there's a caption box right there, and I can click it, type in what I want it to say. That's it. It's really simple. And when you save it, it's there. Those captions are there. Really good question. Okay, I think time's up. I really, I really enjoyed my time with you.